Well, it's that time of year again. Welcome to the 2020 Car Advice Dual Cab Mega Test. We've got eight contenders here. This is going to be exciting. And we're at the skid pan here at the moment at Eastern Creek because we've got some specific testing we want to crank into soon. But first, let's run through the field. The Volkswagen Amarok, been around seemingly forever and yet still one of the best riding and driving dual cabs on the market. And we also love the cabin dynamics. Feels like a premium car. Mitsubishi Triton. That's the one that we tend to recommend as the budget buy, but it's got a contender here today as well and a contender that's going to push it all the way and it's that one. It's the LDV T60. You can buy them around that $40,000 mark drive away so it's going to give the Triton a real run for its money. Over the other side there, the Nissan Navara. That's starting to show its age a little bit. Coil spring rear end differentiates it from the rest of the field. And again, if you're driving around unladen, it's still one that you should be having a look at. Ford Ranger, you want to talk about utes that have been with us seemingly forever. This one has been nearly a decade now and yet still right up at the top of the field, which is very impressive in terms of engineering and what Ford has been able to do. Toyota Hilux, updated face, also rear end and the suspension in general has been tweaked and it rides better than any other Hilux we've tested before and it needed to because it simply wasn't good enough compared to the segment leaders. But now that they've ironed that out, it makes a big difference. Last but definitely not least, the twins, the Isuzu D-Max and the Mazda BT50. This is a hell of a good engineering exercise from Isuzu, there's no doubt about that. And in the testing that you've already seen that we've done, we think that this D-Max is as good, if not better, than everything else in the segment currently. It is that good. Bulletproof engine, which is typical from Isuzu, but the redesign that they've done, the updated safety, the updated infotainment, it's a very, very good dual cab, a compelling proposition. And of course, Mazda's BT50, exactly the same as that under the skin, but with Mazda styling. Just on face value, we think the styling's pretty good too. It could have looked a little ugly if they'd put a CX-9 front end on it, but it looks like a Mazda, but it still looks like a tough truck. This is gonna be fun. Let's get into it. We're testing the top of the range Isuzu D-Max X-Terrain. In addition to the full suite of advanced safety tech, it comes with a body kit, tub liner and roller shutter hard lid, but a tow bar is still optional. All D-Max models are powered by a new 3-litre turbo diesel. The X-Terrain is only available with automatic transmission. We've listed the recommended retail price, but the X-Terrain had an introductory offer of $58,990 drive away at launch. The GT model is the flagship of the Mazda BT50 range. Its recommended retail price is cheaper than the Isuzu D-Max X-Terrain and is available with manual transmission though it misses out on a tub liner and hard lid. As with the Isuzu, a tow bar costs extra. The Mazda is identical to the Isuzu under the skin and has the same advanced safety tech. Over the Isuzu, the BT50 gains an auto dimming mirror, extra padding near the center console and heated leather seats. The Ford Ranger Wildtrak is one of the oldest vehicles in this test, but continual updates have kept it fresh against newer competition. It's had another minor makeover, this time with brighter headlights, a USB port in the rearview mirror housing for a dash cam, and certain functions can now be controlled remotely via a Ford smartphone app. A tow bar is standard on this model, and the Ford is the only one that comes standard with a 12-pin plug. We've tested the 2.0-litre twin turbo with 10-speed auto because we reckon that's the pick. At $65,790 plus on road costs, the price has crept up with the changes. Although the Toyota Hilux, Rugged X and Rogue flagship models are just around the corner, at the time of this test, the Hilux SR5 Plus Pack was the top of the range. The Plus Pack adds heated leather seats. Although the SR5 is still available as a manual, we've tested the automatic and listed the price for the automatic for each of these utes. New for 2020 is a bold new nose, revised suspension, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, and volume dials for the infotainment, as well as a digital speed display. A tow bar remains standard, but there is no tub liner or tonneau cover, and the drive away price has risen by $13,000. The Mitsubishi Triton GLS Premium has just been superseded by the similarly equipped, but renamed Triton GSR. The essentials are the same. The 2.4 litre engine and six speed auto remain, and the 18 inch wheels and chrome grille shown here now have black accents. 
However, for the purposes of our test, the GLS Premium drives the same. The Triton received advanced safety tech two years ago, and those features continue on this model. In this company, the Triton has a $10,000 price advantage, although as our testing revealed, it's starting to show its age. A facelifted Nissan Navara is just around the corner, but for now the N-Trek is Nissan's answer to the Isuzu D-Max X-Terrain, Ford Ranger Wild Track, and Toyota Hilux SR5. The Navara lacks the latest advanced safety aids, though it is one of the few in this test with a 360 degree camera and the only one with clever tie down rails in the ute tub. Last year, the Navara received Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, volume and tuning dials on the infotainment and a digital speed display. Price is on the high side, but this model often attracts driveaway deals. Volkswagen now offers the 580 Newton meter version of its three litre turbo diesel V6 in the mid-grade Highline model. It's the only V6 in this test and the only full-time all-wheel drive in the class. Although it has an outdated five-star safety rating and only four airbags with no airbags for the back seats, the Amarok has the widest cabin, the widest tray and is the most car-like to drive. It's been a while since we've tested an Amarok and it's now one of the oldest in the class, but it's still head and shoulders above the rest in many regards. China's LDV T60 Trail Rider 2 has a $20,000 price advantage going into this test, but it still offers a lot of equipment for the money. Its engine has the least power and torque of the eight utes tested, but it's one of only two vehicles here with four-wheel disc brakes and road tires. It's also missing advanced safety aids, but it does come with a 360-degree camera and one of the largest infotainment screens in the class. We've got a caravan hitched up to the Hilux at the moment, as you can see behind me, and that van weighs around about that 2,000 kilogram mark, which we think is indicative of what the buyer of these dual cabs tends to hitch up to the tow bar and head off out on the open road. Now, there's some things that we're not going to be testing in this phase of the mega test. One of those is laden. We're not going to put five or 600 kilograms in the tray of each of these because at this end of the market, these dual cabs don't tend to get used for work in that purpose. The other thing we're not going to test is off-road. Off-road's a whole separate discipline, a whole separate set of testing criteria. We're going to look at that later. For the moment, we're focusing on what we think and what you're telling us is the core discipline of these dual cabs, and that's lifestyle. People buy them to drive around town, put the family in it, not carry too much weight in the tray, and occasionally hitch up around about that 2,000 kilogram mark and head out onto the open road. So let's have a chat to Josh and Sam. They're doing the bulk of the judging. Josh, first up, these are a lot more lifestyle focused than they used to be. We know that, buyers tell us that, people who are looking in these segments tell us that. And with that has come upgraded braking and safety specifically. What are you gonna be looking for when we're testing these dual cabs in that aspect? Well, these are the new Australian family car. We used to drive Holden Commodores and Ford Falcons for decades. If you look in driveways now, it's usually one of these. In fact, the Toyota Hilux and Ford Ranger have been the top two sellers now for four years in a row. So these are definitely a family car. A lot of people trading in to buy one of these are coming out of SUVs, out of sedans, out of hatchbacks even. So we really wanna see what they are like to live with day to day, what creature comforts they have and how easy they are to live with in the daily grind. And Sam, you've got two kids, so you know exactly the type of buyer that buys these dual cabs. It's someone exactly like you, looks a lot like you. Exactly, <laughs> I know. And with that in mind, you know, setting up baby seats, flexibility of the second row, all that kind of stuff. With that in mind, with that family buyer in mind and that profile, what are you looking for? I think it's, um, it's got two things to do, this car. It's gotta be a family car, but yep. I think in this world of coronavirus, people aren't traveling overseas That's anymore. Right. A lot of people are buying these cars to go away camping go away into the rural towns for the weekends or even going away for weeks at a time on the road. So the cars, putting off-road aside for now, we'll yep. get to that later, but they've got to be comfortable, right? They've got to have a nice, practical and durable interior. They do. And just easy to live with. And especially if you're going to go away for long periods of time, that's very important. Yeah, well, there you go. There's some of the stuff we're going to take a close look at. We're going to start though with infotainment and cabins. So let's get into that. So it's the Hilux you know and love, but not quite the same. There's been changes with this update, obviously, you know, under the skin and the front end uh, in terms of the design, but also inside the cabin, revised infotainment, um, the controls and the layout and the way everything works is all pretty simple and easy to understand. And you get the sense that this is going to be another one of those hard wearing 
Hilux interiors that will stand the test of time. As we've said with a couple of these, not the most comfortable seats in the class, but decent. Uh, they've got enough support. What I do like though is the driving position. Visibility is really good and the dashboard is quite short so you feel like you've got a fair bit of space towards the front of the vehicle. So all in all, not bad at all and certainly indicative of the updates that they've made to this vehicle. It's worth noting that despite the age of the Amarok, this is still one of the best cabins in the class. This seat specifically is one of the best seats in any of the dual cabs. The driving position itself, the dashboard, the fit and finish and quality of everything and the insulation when you close the door makes you feel more like you're in a Volkswagen SUV rather than a dual cab work vehicle, which is what these dual cabs were originally designed to be. This is still a premium interior, despite how long the Amarok's been around. We reckon Ford does the tough truck thing better than any of the other combatants here, and it's hard to define exactly what we mean by that, but think Ford F-150. Ford has a history of building trucks that look tough and that look fit for purpose. We think the Ranger does that very well, and that's why it's so popular with Australian buyers. You'll hear us talk a lot about seat comfort in this test, and there's good reason for that. If you're spending long hours behind the wheel, you want the seats to be comfortable. These are also excellent, maybe just behind the Amarok in terms of quality. Again, this is an old platform, been around for a long time, but what Ford's done is constantly updated it in terms of comfort, visibility, and practicality that keep it right at the head of the class. A lot of the things that we used to criticise about the previous generation Triton, the engineers and designers obviously listened to that feedback because this current Triton, which is a little old now, they changed a lot of those things, particularly the seats, a hell of a lot better in this current generation Triton than they ever were before. And as we've said with a couple of these utes, yes, this does look and feel a little old. So it's been around for a little while, and while it was never at the top of the segment, it's starting to feel like the rest of the segment is moving ahead a little bit. However, there are things about this Triton that are particularly good. I like the screen, which isn't the biggest, it's not flashy, but it looks good, it works well, uh, and the functionality of it is really easy to get your head around. The way the trailer brake is incorporated there into a little blank in the dash, so it's not just shoved onto the front of the dashboard somewhere, it looks really neat. So. While this isn't the most modern and the most up-to-date of the cabins, it's got that hard-wearing feel about it that Mitsubishi's known for. Comfortable, practical. The Nissan Navara, again, another one that's slightly older than some of the others in this test. However, once again, a pretty functional and useful cabin. I like the two-tone trim on the seats. It's comfortable in here, as I said, once you get into position, good visibility, everything's laid out nicely. Infotainment screen, again, not as advanced as the best in the segment, but it still works really well. Um, you've got easy functionality and switch gear, and it's pretty simple to work out what's where and how everything works. And again, I think once you get into this, the fact that it rides as well as it does unladen makes everything more comfortable. So it's a useful cabin, it's a comfortable cabin, and I reckon it's one that the family will enjoy too. So the LDV T60, obviously not as elegant, I suppose is the right word, as the best in the segment, but what I like about this cabin is the fact that if you are on a budget and you do decide to buy this kind of dual cab rather than spending up above 60 for some of the others, you don't really miss out on that much. You've got all the controls, massive screen. So the message is for those of you that are family buyers on a budget that still want the tech and the safety, the LDV is gonna work for you. They're not the most comfortable seats in the segment, but they're certainly not the worst. And don't forget that the passenger seat is electric in the LDV, which you don't always get even in the more expensive vehicles. Well, the newest entrant to the segment, the Mazda BT50, which as we've said, is exactly the same as the Isuzu D-Max, and nowhere is that probably more evident than right here inside the front seat. Now, I think the most interesting thing, and perhaps the only real negative you can throw at the BT50 is that Mazda didn't do more to make the interior more like a Mazda because Mazda interiors are pretty damn good. They're pretty premium, they're really well put together and they're comfortable and user friendly. So there's a lot of stuff in here that is obviously the same as the D-Max and I think Mazda could have maybe moved the game forward a little bit. Different leather trim, so it's a different color in here obviously, but all the switch gear and all the major controls are very much like the Isuzu D-Max still, 
This definitely feels, with the big screen, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and those sorts of features, it certainly feels like the newest dual cab in the segment. So, the jury's in, well, at least we've decided, and this is the best interior in the current crop of dual cabs, the Isuzu D-Max. Really well put together, it impressed us from launch, and it hasn't done anything to lessen that the more time we spend in it. It's pretty much the segment leader in just about every aspect, things like connectivity, the way it all goes together. Um, also, too, the amount of room, the amount of room here, the amount of room in the second row, just everything about the way Isuzu has executed this cabin makes it the current best of the crop. And as we keep saying, when you're spending a lot of time inside any of these dual cabs, that's a really important thing to you. And I think also the other point that's worth noting, Isuzu's have always come across as very hard wearing. People that own them and have owned more of them say they wear well when you're out in the bush and you're using them regularly. If you've got kids, baby seats in the back, family climbing in and out, you want it to be hard wearing. I get the impression and we get the impression that that's the case with the new D-Max. As much as these utes need to be tough workhorses, infotainment is also a potential deal breaker. And that's especially for family and day-to-day -day users. The T60's 10-inch display is big, but the operating system leaves a lot to be desired. Apple CarPlay functionality will solve that problem for a lot of buyers, but we have historically had trouble connecting up via Android Auto. Mitsubishi's Triton has a relatively new 7-inch infotainment display, which is lacking dials, but is relatively easy to use. It gets digital radio, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, but is missing native navigation. Standard across the Amarok range is a 6.33 inch infotainment display. And what it lacks in size, it does make up for in quality and functionality. It's easy to use and navigate with volume and tuning dials and a good overall design. The Amarok does miss out on digital radio, however. Nissan's Navara got a much needed update in the infotainment stakes in 2019, bringing Apple CarPlay and Android Auto to the eight inch system. There are also TomTom -tom maps and volume dials for ease of use, but no digital radio. To save your time and save me wasting my breath, I'll bundle the identical Mazda and Isuzu units together. The screen is big, nine inches, but functionality trips over without any dials to operate, and the operating system isn't as easy to use or function laden as some of the better examples. It's also a little bit dark sometimes. Toyota's recent update has boosted the Hilux's stocks in the technology department, with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto now available through the 8-inch infotainment display. There's also digital radio, native navigation and volume dials. Not a lot to complain about here. The Ford Ranger's infotainment system is also 8 inches and ticks many important boxes. Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, digital radio and native navigation. The operating system is a little bit more slick than the Toyota's with better functionality and a more modern appearance. Plus, volume and tuning dials makes it more easy to use on the move. So that's the front seats taken care of. Now let's take a quick look at the second row because as we said, these are default family vehicles in 2020 and that means the back seat is almost as important as the front. All of these utes bring with them a compromise in the second row when you compare it to a sedan or an SUV. However, some are worse than others. There's no traditional air vents for the Triton, but there is a roof-mounted fan that is there to help circulate air throughout the cabin, plus there's two USB points. The Hilux does get air vents, however, and a couple of curry hooks for your takeaway food. Another without aircon vents is the Ranger, and that's a hint of how old this platform actually is. But there is a household power outlet there and a 12 volt as well. Nissan's Navara gets a trick sliding rear window, something that I would love to see more utes adopt in the future. There are no power outlets in the rear, but air vents are accounted for. LDV's T60 covers off the basics nicely. There's air vents and a 12 volt power outlet. However, after all the numbers have been crunched, and believe me, there's been plenty of that, it's the Amarok that doesn't quite make the mark in this dual cab mega test in the second row. While there's a lot to love about the front row, the second row just can't cut it with the segment leaders. It's a long way off the pace. Now, I know we sound like broken records, but it's not just about the lack of second row airbags. That's part of it. It's also only got one 12 volt outlet. It's got no air vents. It's got the least amount of room back here now in the class and it's just not as good as the best in the segment. So while it's serviceable and it is usable, it's a long way off the pace. 
It's actually pretty close in which one we think is the best in the second row between the Twins, the Isuzu and the Mazda, and the Ford Ranger. But the Ford Ranger doesn't get rear air vents and there's probably just a little bit more room in the Twins. So we're in the Isuzu at the moment, but you get plenty of room back here, good visibility, you get air vents, you get a USB plug, you get a comfortable seat. There's enough room for your feet under the front seat as well. It's a pretty good place to be. And if you've got kids, as they grow into teenage years, they'll still be comfortable back here. Whereas the ones that are tighter, as they get older and they get taller, it's gonna be more of a problem. But we reckon the Isuzu and the Mazda are the best when it comes to second row space. If you're using your ute on the daily grind, chances are your reversing camera is going to get a fair workout. And while all utes have one, there is some variance in the quality and quantity of cameras. While the LDV has a 360 degree camera system, the quality of the image is quite bad and negates any benefits you get from the bird's eye view. Personally, I'd prefer to have a single clear and quality rear view camera like this one in the Toyota Hilux. We noticed that the Amarok's camera is low slung and very wide with the view partially obscured by the tray. The new twins offer good clarity on a big screen, but we would love to see a little bit more brightness in the display of both the D-Max and the BT-50. The 270 degree display in the Triton is handy, but it is lacking a little bit in screen size and clarity, while the Ranger offers a solid single camera setup. If you want to just compare rear view cameras, the Nissan Navara does have to take the win because it's a good display with decent clarity and there is an effective bird's eye view from that 360 degree camera system. So it's back here at the trays where not all these dual cabs are created equal and that's why we reckon the Ford Ranger has the best standard tray of all the dual cabs. First of all, the tailgate, super light. Some of them are particularly heavy. Secondly, you've got the electric roll lid. You've got four tie down points. None of them are gonna save the world, but at least they're there. You've got 12 volt power and tub lighting. And of course, that tailgate you can access via the key or the button here. Makes it really easy to use. Some of the trays in these utes are simply just that, just a tray with no embellishments at all. Toyota's Hilux and Mazda's BT50 are as bare as they come, without even tub liners. Mitsubishi's Triton gets a tub liner and tie down points, but that hard lid is an optional extra. In this specification, the Volkswagen Amarok has no tub liner, but there is a 12 volt outlet. And while that sports bar might look flash, it actually inhibits access to the tub from the side. The LDV and Isuzu get a manual and lockable roller cover which keeps the weather out and makes the tub somewhat secure. There's also a tub liner for each of these utes and tie down points. Now we have to make an honourable mention of the Nissan Navara's tray and it's just about lunchtime and we've spent all morning taking the tonneau cover off. So let's just assume that doesn't exist because it's rubbish. But when you take the tonneau cover off you get a good tray liner, you get four sturdy tie down hooks and crucially for us, which we think something all the utes should mimic, is this adjustable rail here. These have got tie downs that you can unscrew, slide them along into any position that you want, and it makes it really easy to secure any load that you carry. In last year's ute mega test, we assessed emergency braking from 100 kilometers an hour. However, on this skid pan, the run up restricted us to testing braking distances from 80 kilometers an hour. Predictably, utes with road tyres and four-wheel disc brakes, the Volkswagen Amarok and the LDV T60 Trail Rider, performed best. The Hilux, D-Max and BT50 stopped in the same average brake distance as each other as they were on identical Bridgestone tyres. The Ranger, also on the same Bridgestone rubber, took longer to pull up, consistent with numerous other brake tests we've conducted with this car. Meanwhile, the Toyo tyres on the Nissan Navara saw it consistently take the longest to pull up. When it came to wet braking, conducted at 70 kilometres an hour due to the runoff area, utes equipped with road tyres, the Volkswagen and LDV, once again topped the class and stopped in the shortest distance. The rest of the field, most of which were on Bridgestones, were line ball. The wet weather braking of Toyo tyres on the Navara were again near the back of the pack but the biggest disappointment was the Dunlops on the Triton. They had the longest braking distance by some margin. It's worth noting all utes were tested in the wet and dry on their recommended tyre pressures. For this year's mega test, we drove all eight utes over the same road loop without carrying a load 
and once again while towing a 2,000 kilo caravan. As mentioned earlier, we'll do a load carrying and an off-road comparison in a separate test. Our road loop had a mix of suburban and freeway driving, though not much stop-start traffic, so fuel economy figures were generally good. The Isuzu D-Max may not have the most power and torque in this group, but it makes good use of its available grunt and uses its gearbox well to hold ratios. The engine is more refined than before, but similar to other contenders rather than being a standout for quietness. Suspension is relatively supple, and in our opinion, the D-Max has the best electric power steering feel in a ute to date. However, our road loop and slalom test showed the Isuzu has a tendency to squeal its front tyres and trigger stability control more readily than the others. Overall though, it's certainly caught up to the class leaders. The Mazda BT50 is the twin under the skin to the Isuzu D-Max after Mazda's 50-year partnership with Ford came to an end. The previous BT50 was based on the 2011 Ford Ranger, so the new BT50 has also had a big step up. Although it has a unique body and minor changes to the interior, the BT50 is identical to the D-Max underneath. With the same engine, transmission and suspension tune, unsurprisingly the Mazda drives just like a D-Max. As with the D-Max, the Mazda is not class leading to drive, but it's near the top of the class among heavy duty four wheel drive utes. The Ford Ranger Wild Track remains one of the benchmarks for the Ute class, despite being the second oldest here. Its electric power steering system is light and easy, but the Isuzu and Mazda twins feel like they're a generation ahead. The Ranger has good road holding and reasonable comfort over bumps, but judges noted its smaller brakes and body shake or head toss on certain bumps, such as when entering or leaving a steep driveway. Other Utes didn't display the same behaviour. The twin turbo 2 litre is perky, but the 10-speed auto occasionally shunts gears. Surprisingly, despite having the equal smallest engine, the Ranger was not as frugal as the bigger capacity engines in the Mazda Isuzu and Hilux. Changes to the Toyota Hilux SR5 are more than skin deep. Toyota has overhauled the suspension and the Hilux is now right up there alongside Ranger in terms of comfort over bumps and cornering grip. The extra power in the 2.8 litre turbo diesel is subtle but noticeable and no longer feels like it's working hard. Brake pedal feel is good, and although the Hilux runs hydraulic power steering, in isolation it has a light and precise feel. Fuel economy unladen was respectable. The Mitsubishi Triton looks modern, but from behind the wheel it's starting to show its age. The engine and transmission work well and have average levels of refinement. The tight turning circle, thanks to the short wheelbase, is an advantage the Triton has over others. Emergency braking in the dry was better than expected, but poor in the wet. Recent updates to safety tech have helped the Triton keep pace. Overall though, the Triton feels like an older ute, but with sharp pricing across the range, it remains a strong value proposition. After numerous revisions, the suspension is finally sorted and the Navara feels good on the road. But not everyone was a fan of its high seating position and its fuel economy advantage has been eroded by newer competition. The Toyo tyres and smallish brakes were also left wanting in our wet and dry brake tests. The Volkswagen Amarok is now the oldest ute in the segment, but it's still impressive to drive. Backed by a 3 litre V6, 8 speed auto and a full time all wheel drive system previously used in the Porsche Cayenne and Audi Q7, the Amarok feels in many ways like the hot hatch of utes. It has class leading grip in corners and while its lack of advanced safety tech and rear airbags continue to weigh against it, the Amarok remains the best ute in the class to drive with effortless power and high levels of comfort. The LDV T60 Trail Rider 2 is new for 2020. A new single turbo 2 litre diesel developed in house by LDV has replaced the previous 2.8. Despite the changes, the T60 Trail Rider still has the least power and torque in this test and the engine was noisiest by far, even by ute standards. It makes the most of its locally tuned suspension and continental road tyres and quality rubber and four wheel discs provide good braking performance, but overall the T60 could still do with further improvement to steering and handling. That said, in this test it's the most metal for the money. For our tow test we had a new age manta ray pop top caravan in their 16 foot configuration. Weighing in at a neat 2,000 kilograms, tow ball mass is reasonably low on this model with 160 kilos listed when unladen. When fuel economy is concerned, bigger engines unsurprisingly ruled the roost when it came to towing. 
with the 3 litre D-Max, BT50 and Amarok all managing to return the same low number. Ford's 2 litre Ranger came next, while Mitsubishi's Triton was the thirstiest of the bunch. It's worth noting here we are discounting LDV's indicated number because it's just too low to bridge the realm of possibility. When towing, Toyota's Hilux is a solid improvement over the older model, feeling perky off the line and through the throttle inputs to drag our caravan without too many dramas. The suspension also felt impressive, firming up nicely with the weight on the back. Also, no complaints about the steering. Despite having 50 less newton meters of peak torque available, both the D-Max and the BT50 had a nice effortless feel through the driveline. There is torque available literally everywhere. Suspension performance was also controlled and comfortable, but we did note a vague and wandering off-center feel through steering at highway speeds. This did mar an otherwise impressive performance. However, the best tow vehicle was in front by a big margin. Sporting the most power and torque, the V6 Amarok was the closest thing to a completely effortless towing experience. Suspension and steering was also bang on, and the permanent all-wheel drive meant there's no chirping from the rear end when you're trying to take off quickly. Revs barely need to go over 3000 RPM and the gearbox is also sharp and decisive. This is a great tow vehicle. Well, I said it a couple of times throughout the course of this video, but we almost got to the point with these dual cabs where we were splitting hairs because it really is that difficult and that tight when it comes to trying to determine a winner in some of these disciplines. Some of them are so close, it's almost impossible to separate them. But if you look through the whole field as we're doing here, there's still positives across the board. Start with this LDV at around about $40,000 drive away right now. It's incredibly good value for money and the story that it's telling is that if you're on a budget, a tight budget, you don't have to go and buy a second-hand dual cab and miss out on some of the safety because this has got a good warranty, it's got a five-star ANCAP safety rating. Mitsubishi Triton, probably the best value of the main players outside the contender brands, this one is the one that we recommend more often than not. It's not at the top of the segment really in any of the disciplines, but it's still good value for money, really good warranty, and of course Mitsubishi's have that bulletproof reputation. If you go to the Nissan Navara, it is starting to feel its age, I think that's fair to say. I've personally always liked the Navara and I still think the fact that it's got a coil spring rear end separates it from the rest of the segment and it also rides really well unladen around town. So if you don't use the tray to carry weight a lot, you probably should have a look at a Nissan Navara. Lastly, in terms of the contenders before we get to the winners, the top three, the Volkswagen Amarok. This thing, all of us as judges, in one way it does our head in because it's an old vehicle. It's been around for nearly a decade and yet it's got the best engine and gearbox combination. It rides, if not the best, as good as the best. It tows unbelievably well because the V6 engine is so good. It's reasonably efficient and the cabin feels like you're driving an SUV. So it's hard to get your head around the fact that this thing is as old as it is because it's still right up at the top of the segment in so many areas. So time to reveal our top three and in fact, it's actually a top four this time. We've got equal winners, the Isuzu D-Max and the Mazda BT50. No real surprise there because they are the two newest in the segment, so you would expect them to be at the head of it. In second place, the Ford Ranger. Been around for a little while and it only just edges out the Toyota Hilux. This is a good thing, actually, the Hilux. It's a really good update. Guys, before I ask you the three questions I, I want to get some information on, I've got another one for you. Um, it's no surprise, as I said, they're the two newest in the segment, but Josh, what do you like about the D-Max and the BT50 specifically? I really love the fact that Isuzu and Mazda, as it happens, because we, as we know, they're twins under the skin, they have swept the details. Every available piece of advanced safety tech is on both those trucks, in fact, every model in the range. Although there are a few buzzers there you might want to turn off without disabling the safety altogether. And that three litre turbo diesel, what a beauty matched well to that six-speed auto, quite effortless when towing. I think it's a great combination. I think a point to make as well that will it will be in the written review is the fact that there's a couple of things you get with the Isuzu you don't get with the Mazda, a couple of things you get with the Mazda you don't get with the Isuzu, which is why we've got them even. Sam, what impressed you about those two, mate? We all know how far the D-Max has jumped since the old generation. Like, we love the old guy, but it was pretty unrefined, it was pretty rough. This one has jumped right to the top of the field, but it still feels like a D-Max, and I think it's mostly due to the engine and gearbox. It's got that nice power delivery. It still feels like an Isuzu, and Mazda, they've jumped on the right horse, haven't they? I absolutely jumped on the right horse, yeah. Okay, question time. I've got three each. Short answers. <laughs> all right, all right, this will be difficult. You ready? Yeah, it's like beat the buzzer. Um, first of all, 
I want to know what impressed you the most. Out of all eight, just pick one ute that did something that impressed you the most. I'm really impressed with the Toyota Hilux. I know we gave a lot of praise when we did our three-way test with the D-Max and Ranger recently, but Toyota should have launched this at a skid pan because doing these exercises this week has really shown me Toyota just didn't sweat the details on suspension change. They also fiddled with the stability control. This is a really great truck. I'd have to agree with that. The, the, the stability control on this is actually probably the best on any Toyota I've tested in a long time. Usually we say it's over-enthusiastic, but on this particularly good. Sam, what for you, mate? One ute, one thing. Ford Ranger, I think I've said it before, but old bones, yeah. constant development, that whole story. Ford has done a great job with this Ranger and it's still playing with the best in the field and I think you've got to really give kudos to Ford for doing so well. I wasn't going to throw my idea in, but I will tell you that I reckon the Amarok has impressed me because every other manufacturer has a tendency to say, no, no, we don't need a V6 engine. Yeah, you do. Uh, yeah, you actually <laughs> do. You only need to drive that thing and tow with it to work out that you do need a V6 engine. Okay, secondly, What's one thing that you reckon all these dual cabs can do better? They all need to drive better in the wet, with the exception of the Amarok, which is great. It's on road tyres, obviously. But all these things are dicey. And I just feel for families who are new to the double cab ute market, the first time they hit a roundabout in the rain, there's a good chance they're going to get a bit of a fright. So I think all of these could improve wet weather driving. Sam, for you? For me, it's probably the towing performance. They all have three and a half tonne towing, but they're a little bit lacking in that regard. We had two tonne here and they all did it quite well, but throw an extra tonne in there and it's probably going to be a really different story. So I'd like to see a bit more done in that regard. Yeah, fair point, because 2,000 kilo isn't really challenging them as much as you could if you wanted to go closer to that. While we're on a roll, I'm going to keep tossing my little two cents worth in here. I reckon all of them could look at each other inside the cabin and pick and choose all the best elements and into one dual cab. You know, extra USB, extra vents, different power options, better screens, different switch gear, change the way the centre console is, more storage. We still don't have, and we say this a lot, the perfect dual cab. You know, we still don't have it. So I think they could all take a little bit from each other. Okay, now this is crunch time. We know that the twins have won, but you've got, let's call it 65, 70,000 bucks in your bank right now. You're driving away with one truck, which one are you buying? Well, I know we rated the Twins as the best here because we do have to take in every factor. Yeah. But some of those factors will have different levels of importance for some customers. Yeah. So for me, I'm going to buy the V6 Amarok. <laughs> ah, right. Because you're not using the second row. Space Correct. safety doesn't matter. It's more about towing in the front row. Well, you still get five-star safety in terms of occupant protection in yeah. the front seats, yeah. and you get car-like handling or SUV-like handling, if we're honest. And I just love that engine. It is the hot hatch of utes for me. Okay. Sambo, you? Which one are you buying, mate? I remember when Volkswagen launched that V6. They said it's the engine that the Amarok always deserved. And you have to agree with them because it slots in there yeah, perfectly. Absolutely. It's given the thing a new lease on life. It does. But there are a few things that you can't look past with that car. And so you're a family buyer. That's right, right? exactly. So yeah. if I'm buying new, I'm buying safe. I'm looking at that Isuzu, I think. Okay, interesting, interesting. Well, that's the same for me, actually. I'd have the D-Max. I really tossed it up because I would tow a lot and I would use uh, the capability. So probably V6 and all-wheel drive would help me. But I think if I could only buy one right now, I'd buy the D-Max. So just to recap, equal first, the Isuzu D-Max and the Mazda BT50. As the guys said, they've got the safety, they've got the updates, quality infotainment, quality cabins, refined, really refined things to drive. Three liter engine is a cracker. Six speed automatic leaves you asking the question of why you need nine and 10 in other vehicles. They're just a really good all round package. No surprise they're at the head of the class. In second place, Ford Ranger, seemingly been around forever now, but still right up at the top. And of course, in third place, just edged out by the Ranger, the Toyota Hilux. We often criticise Toyota for not making a big enough step when they do an update. I think we need to acknowledge the fact that this is a big step forward and they've done a particularly good job with this dual cab. So, as always, let us know what you think in the comments section below, particularly which one would you buy and why. Click on subscribe, hit like if you've enjoyed the video. And as always, go to caradvice.com for all the updates.